the president of the Bar Association, um, uh, the president of the Bar Association of India, Mr. Prashant Kumar, Mr. Sham Divan, Dr. Pinky Anand, Dr. Ramindita Pujari, the members of the Bar, my dear students present here, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I thank the Bar Association of India for giving me the opportunity to be here today to share my thoughts with you. As a member of the Bar Association of India, I was made a life member of the Bar Association in 1999. It gives me special pleasure to be here on this occasion. It also makes me feel nostalgic because the last time I had really addressed the Bar Association was in December 1999 when at that time I was a lawyer of the Canada High Court, not a judge. I had presented a paper when the Bar Association of India had been observing 50 years of the Indian Republic. I thank you once again. I am really glad that the Bar Association of India has commenced open house seminars once again. This is important. I have had occasion to participate in virtual seminars, but it is not quite the same because there is always more interaction when there is an open house seminar and such interactions are extremely important. The Bar Association of India has a great tradition. It is almost as old as I am. I must have been not even two when the Bar of Association of India was founded on 8th August 1959. On 2nd April 1960, it was formally inaugurated by none other than the President of India, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, in the presence of the then Vice President of India, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, the then Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and others. The, it was founded, the founder president was none other than M.C. Settlement. And the, the association has seen numerous legal luminaries as its office bearers. This fills us with a sense of pride and it is for us to keep up the tradition by holding seminars of this, uh, this kind. This association contributes to the development of the law. I, for myself, can say after slightly over 20 years of judging in constitutional courts that the best judgments come when there is good assistance from the lawyers. It is not that the judges write all the judgments on their own. The, the, their interpretation of the law is based on the assistance that is rendered by the lawyers. Seminars of this kind enable lawyers and the future lawyers whom I see amongst you to properly assist the court. 
the data protection bill is extremely important that has been emphasized by both my previous speakers mr shyam divand and mr prashant kumar as a matter of fact whatever i say now would be a repetition repetitions can be boring and i will try and avoid it to the extent possible so as i was saying as as of now we do not have any data protection bill as such the only law which we have is the right to information act and the right to information act does not even refer to the smartphone now as we all know and it hardly needs emphasis one of the <clears throat> most notable notable technological developments in the last 3 or 4 uh, decades has been in the field of computers and particularly in the field of information technology before i became a judge the internet had been introduced but one had to access the internet through the telephones and the telephones would remain <coughs> engaged all night telephone connections were also not was not as easy then as they are today so one could use access the internet only at night today times have changed <coughs> we have become totally dependent on the internet today perhaps there are 800 million users in india of the internet and uh, technical entities you know your whatsapp facebook facebook has a new name now meta meta yes i am not on the facebook <laughs> google has <coughs> a large <coughs> number of clients in this country today much of the business <coughs> is transacted transacted online contracts are executed online banking business is also conducted online applications important applications are made online for which one has to disclose personal information and the personal information which is disclosed somehow does not remain a secret because i have myself received all kinds of telephone calls particularly on the number which i maintained for from my lawyer days are you are you so and so you are a holder you are a member of such and such place and then i ju i just disconnect saying that i'm sorry but i don't know how much of data gets stolen in the process mr divan was just telling me how his mother a very senior citizen had been getting calls ostensibly from banks seeking information now the senior citizens usually fall prey you know to such calls and they innocently provide information thinking that the queries are genuine queries made by a bank there are many pensioners there are many women who are family pensioners <clears throat> and they feel that unless they provide the information their 
pension may be stopped and they answer the queries talking about myself even my telephones registered in the name of the secretary general of the supreme court or earlier in the name of the secretary general of the, uh, the registrar general of the calcutta high court were not spared from messages i was just telling uh, mr divan that i am a million multi 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 millionaire on paper <laughs> the number of lotteries i have won <laughs> in dollars <laughs> yes <laughs> i've never been very good at mathematics that's been my weak point <laughs> so if you uh, convert the uh, dollars into indian rupees it would be phenomenal it would be a phenomenal amount the thing is you have to disclose a bank account number <laughs> and if someone gets taken away someone once advised me that why don't you just open an account and give that number an account which has very little money in it maybe <clears throat> nothing and see what happens i said you would want to know what happens <laughs> through that account they will get the details of all other accounts that you hold and you will be denuded of whatever you have in the hope of lottery now these people they organize they they operate from remote places all over the world they are seldom within the country another problem which we as lawyers often face is cyber defaming which has become a very serious problem whenever we sit in the criminal jurisdiction we find complaints of posts which are in complete breach of privacy <coughs> on <coughs> 17th august 2017 the supreme court delivered its judgment in justice case putu swami versus union of india the nine judge bench held that the right to privacy was a fundamental right it was a unanimous decision of the nine judge bench but if we go through the judgment very carefully of course it is a very lengthy judgment running into hundreds of pages <clears throat> you will find that the judgment itself has some exceptions to the rule of privacy perhaps persons who hold public positions and public posts cannot claim the same kind of privacy as other private persons <clears throat> a person like me i would have a dual role i am an individual as an individual i may be entitled to some privacy but holding a public office there has also to be transparency information and privacy need balancing as has been stated by Mr. Divan and Mr. Kumar. We have to see where the control. The the data mill is also about some checks and balances, controls. There are exceptions. Public interest 
national security. It is important to see that the power is exercised bona fide and the limits are observed and maintained. While holding that the right to privacy is an intrinsic part of the right to life and personal liberty, and that informational privacy is a facet of the right to privacy, the Supreme Court highlighted the need for the government to examine and enforce a robust regime for data protection. What is required is a balance between data regulation and personal privacy on the one hand and legitimate state concerns like protecting national security, preventing and investigating crime, encouraging innovation and the spread of knowledge and the like. But it is extremely important to guard against any kind of encroachment in the garb, uh, into the right of privacy, in the garb of protecting national security, in the garb of prevention and investigation of crime. Since there is only a shade of difference and a lot of <clears throat> overlapping discussions in this regard are extremely important. Pursuant to the observations and our directions of the Supreme Court in the Puttaswami case, a committee of experts was constituted which was headed by the former Supreme Court Judge, Justice B. N. Sri Krishna. And a white paper was released to facilitate comments from the public. Any effective law needs to be discussed threadbare before it is actually enacted. And I quite agree with Mr. Diwan that it is better not to have a law than to have a hurriedly draft drafted law which creates more problems than the problems it solves. Now we come into some of the salient features of the Data Protection Bill. Initially in 2019 or in 2018, there was a private data protection bill, but then there were uh, discussions as to whether it should be restricted to personal data alone and in 2021 the uh, <coughs> data protection bill was uh, prepared. It is interesting <clears throat> to come across provisions like expressions, expressions like the data fiduciary, the sandbox, <clears throat> with, I must confess, 
that I belong to a generation which first used a computer. I first used a computer when I was about 42 years of age. Unlike, unlike many of you today, very familiar with computers. And as I just mentioned a little while back, at the time of my elevation, the internet had to be accessed through the telephones. It was a time-consuming time affair and very often one could not connect because the lines were so busy. After elevation, time to access the internet actually became restricted. So I am not, though I do use the internet, I <coughs> do not use the internet as much as you do. So far as banking is concerned, I still write out checks. <laughs> and was in immense difficulty for about two and a half months when because of a burnt right thumb, I could neither, neither write nor sign nor do anything with my right hand. Thank God that has got cured completely now. There was the Joint Parliamentary Committee that was chaired by Sri P. P. Chaudhary tabled the report on the Data Protection Bill before both Houses of Parliament on 16 December 2021. The document comprises of two parts. <coughs> the first half is the report and the second is the amended bill. The committee deliberated over the bill for two years, during which the bill did undergo substantial changes. Discussions of this kind, seminars of this kind, have <coughs> Are, are, are very important because it enables you to still give suggestions because there will be more deliberations on the bill before the bill is actually enacted. And that apart, there is likely to be litigation, a lot of litigation once it is enacted. So you will be in a position to effectively assist the courts in rendering justice. It hardly needs mention, there was talk. My previous speaker, Mr. Prashant Kumar, referred to the bureaucracy <coughs> and their arbitrary ways of functioning. But then the courts are there to balance and the, cons the constitutional courts, the Supreme Court, the High Court, these are guardians of the Constitution. They protect the fundamental rights, <coughs> keeping in mind also the limitations to the exercise of the rights. The new legislation, unlike the proposed legislation, I must say, because it is still at the bill stage. It will deal both with personal and non-personal data. <coughs> Today, with a lot of business, trade, commerce being transacted online with contracts, including intellectual property agreements and contracts being executed online. 
there may be data with regard to processes of manufacture, data with regard to business secrets, the data <coughs> with regard to the economic position of corporate bodies and other business entities, so on and so forth. Again, there will have to be balancing between the right to privacy, which is a fundamental right, and the right to information, which is perhaps also a fundamental right. You cannot say that it is not. While the data of the individual can be protected, the data maintained by organizations may be open to disclosure if there is an application under the Right to Information Act. <clears throat> to what extent is the information to be disclosed? To what information is the information to be withheld? Of course, even under the Right to Information Act, not all information is open to disclosure. Some kind of information need not be disclosed. Another important thing in the bill is that the government is to follow a timeline for implementation of the law on data protection. <coughs> the suggested period is approximately 24 months for implementation of the provisions of the statute as and when the statute is enacted. Now comes the question of jurisdiction. So far as the Indian courts are concerned and the power of the Indian legislature to enact law is concerned. While Control can be exercised on data operators, person storing data within the country. It becomes extremely difficult to protect the data when such data is uh, preserved or stored outside the country. Here again, the law envisages calling upon business entities to set up offices in, within the country and to set up uh, centers within the country so that they can be brought within the control of the Indian local authority and the Indian laws. But how far this is going to be feasible is very difficult to say. This is something which only time can tell. So a policy will have to be formulated for gradual data localization. I don't think anything can really be done overnight so far as this aspect is concerned. government is to be asked to establish a mechanism for certification of all digital devices. The committee has recommended that the government should make efforts to establish a mechanism for the formal certification process for all digital and information technology devices that will ensure the integrity of all such devices 
with respect to data security. <clears throat> Social media platforms are to be treated as publishers and be regulated for the content they host. This is the recommendation that such publishers are to be held accountable for the content they host. But then again, if you have entities which do not have uh, any base <coughs> within the country, now the internet is a means by which information can be transmitted in a matter of seconds, maybe from India to the opposite end of the globe. Uh, <coughs> this would also be difficult uh, policies, rules, regulations would have to be evolved in this regard. There is recommendation of a fixed timeline of 72 hours to breach reporting, <coughs> reporting in breach of, uh, of personal data. Now, <coughs> the recommended time is 72 hours. Now, whether, whether this is sufficient or not, whether there should be some provision for extension of the time, these are also matters which uh, require consideration. I think I've taken up a lot of your time. I should conclude since you have working sessions ahead, working sessions which are going to be addressed by persons who have worked in the area and have immense, <coughs> immense knowledge. On my part, I wish this seminar a success and I hope this seminar will go a long way towards effective implementation of data protection laws, rules, policies and procedures in this country and I also hope that the Bar Association of India will hold more such open seminars for the lawyers. Thank you very much.